All right, in this short video, I'm going to be specifically talking about Harry Frankfurt's article, Freedom of the Will and the Concept of a Person. And uh, what Harry Frankfurt does in this article is he offers a slightly different analysis of free will um, than some of the others that are available in the classical literature on this. Okay, now, so Frankfurt begins by just discussing the nature of freedom of the will and um, how it relates to personhood. So Frankfurt thinks that um, freedom of the will and the concept of moral responsibility are really important or play a crucial role in distinguishing between persons and non-persons. Um, now, so what that means is there can be persons that are not human beings, and it's also possible for there to be human beings that are not persons. A lot of times we use the term person just automatically to mean human being. We sort of think that those terms are coextensive, but they're not. So what makes you a human being is just certain biological facts about you, the fact that you're a homo sapien, the fact that you're a particular kind of animal. What makes you a person would rather be certain psychological facts about you, um, the ability to engage in certain kinds of rational deliberation about your desires. And for Frankfurt, that is really what is important here with freedom of the will. Um, Frankfurt also points out that a lot of times when philosophers are talking about free will, what they are really talking about is freedom of action. But Frankfurt thinks this is a mistake. Um, free will, having free will and having freedom of action are clearly related to each other, but they are distinct. Okay, so According to Frankfurt, you possess free will or your will is free if you have the type of will that you desire to have. Now, so whether or not you have the type of will that you desire to have, or in another sense, whether or not you're the kind of person that you want to be or desire to be, that's largely irrelevant to the question of whether or not your actions are free. So certainly freedom of the will is necessary for freedom of action. So you can't act freely um, without having freedom of the will, but you can still possess freedom of the will and in some sense still be morally responsible as a person, even if your actions aren't free. And if we understand that some notion of the principle of alternative possibilities, whether we talk about the capacity to do otherwise or the ability to do otherwise or the opportunity to do otherwise, um, if those types of concerns are relevant to freedom of action, Frankfurt thinks that the ability to do otherwise is neither sufficient nor necessary for moral responsibility. That is one of the main claims that he um, defends in this article, as we'll get to momentarily. Okay, now, so if your freedom of the will consists of having the kind of will that you desire to have, well, then it's important to discuss uh, the nature of different kinds of desires. All right, so first we have first order desires. So a first order desire would just be a desire for something in particular um, or a desire that some state of affairs obtain. Okay, so if currently um, I desire to have another cup of coffee or I desire that um, the bears win this weekend or something like that, those would all be first order desires. So I have a particular thing in mind that I either desire to possess or, or something that I desire to come to be. Okay, now, and of particular importance here with respect to our desires is this. Um, it's possible to have rival desires at the same time, psychologically. So uh, you can desire to go out and stay in at the same time, uh, for example. And to say that these are rival desires just means that they can't both be satisfied simultaneously. So uh, to satisfy one desire means that the other desire goes unsatisfied. Or to act in accordance with one desire means that uh, you don't act in accordance with another desire. So there, there's nothing logically problematic about having rival or conflicting desires at the same time. Now, it's we're also psychologically capable of desiring things that are impossible. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you might relate to this, but when I was a kid, I desired to have superpowers. In particular, um, I wanted to be able to fly like Superman, you know, just take off the ground 
uh, and you know fly around. Uh, I maybe I, at one point in time I uh, desired to have the ability to become invisible or something like that. Okay, now but these kinds of things are metaphysically impossible for human beings to possess. I mean, human beings, given the nature of the kinds of things that we are, we we couldn't possibly have the the ability to fly like Superman. We couldn't possibly have the ability to become invisible. Uh, so those kinds of things are metaphysically impossible for us to possess those kinds of powers. But that nevertheless stops us from uh, desiring having those kinds of things. Uh, you you know, you might have desired at one point in time or, or wished to be born in a different time period to a different family, to a different set of parents, right? But given certain um, pretty reasonable beliefs about the nature of origins and stuff like that. Um, so I may, you know, uh, daydream about being born to a different family or being born to a different set of parents, but metaphysically, I couldn't possibly be born to a different set of parents. But even if that's true, and I know that that's true, uh, that may not actually stop me from desiring that. Okay, now another sort of desire would be second order desires. So. First order desires concern a desire for something in particular or a desire that some state of affairs obtain. Second order desires, on the other hand, are desires that concern the nature of our first order desires. All right. Now, a particular example of this would be um, a desire for whether or not a given first order desire is effective or ineffective. Okay. So, an effective first order desire is a desire that actually produces a behavior or produces an action. So if I desire to stay in one evening and then I actually stay in that evening, that would be an effective first order desire. Now, if my second order desires and my first order desires match up, so I desire to stay in and I have the desire that the desire to stay in be effective, that means that I possess the kind of will that I want. And if I possess the kind of will that I want, I have free will. Okay, so this is what Frankfurt refers to as a second order volition. So a second order volition is when your first order desires and your second order desires kind of match up, or as I say here, um, freedom of the will concerns some sort of congruence between first order desires and second order desires. And then when you have Second order desires and first order desires that are congruent with each other, and then uh, action is produced by a first order desire, that would be a second order volition. Okay. Now, with respect to persons, so persons have freedom of the will in virtue of being able to engage in what Frankfurt calls second order deliberation. So, um, persons are the kinds of individuals who actually have concerns about the makeup of their will and the nature of their will. So um, I can have certain kinds of first order desires, but then wish or desire that my first order desires be different. Okay, so for example, um, if I'm on a diet, um, I may want the donut, but given the fact that I am a diet, I may want to not want the donut. Or, um, you know, if I've been doing really well on my diet, I want the donut at the first order level, but then at the second order level, um, I desire that my desire to eat a donut be effect, uh, be ineffective, rather. Why? Because I want to stick to my diet. You know, that's the kind of person I want to be and the kind of will that I want to have. So specifically here, I want to have the sort of will where I'm actually capable of resisting temptation or um, actually having the willpower to to see something through. So human beings um, as persons are capable of engaging in that kind of second order deliberation where we genuinely have care and concern over the nature and the makeup of our wills. Okay, now, but what Frankfurt refers to as wontons, these would be individuals who lack the ability to engage in second order deliberation. Now, so the link here with moral responsibility is this. So if having freedom of the will is necessary for moral responsibility and freedom of the will consists of having the kind of will that you desire to have, which requires second order deliberation, that means that 
wontons lack freedom of the will for that reason, because wontons are incapable of engaging in second order deliberation. And since wontons lack the ability to engage in second order deliberation, um, wontons lack free will. And since they lack free will, they are not morally responsible. Okay, so persons are morally responsible because persons can have the kind of will that they want to have in virtue of being able to engage in second order deliberation. But since wontons do not have the ability to engage in second order deliberation, wontons lack freedom of the will and hence wontons are not morally responsible for their actions. So examples of wontons would be, um, as far as Frankfurt is concerned, all non-human animals, uh, you know, infants and babies, and then possibly um, individuals that have certain kinds of mental disabilities, individuals with Alzheimer's or dementia, um, individuals that may be senile. These would all be examples of individuals who probably are wontons. Now, it's even possible, Frankfurt says, for uh, individuals, human individuals that are kind of more or less rational and cognizant can sometimes act like wontons. Uh, for example, if sometimes we are on what I just call autopilot, where we're just going through our day-to-day -day routine, not particularly paying attention to anything. Why? Because it's routine. Um, so you may be at the grocery store. Um, so I had this happen once. Um, it was my birthday and I was buying beer, so I got carded. And as the, uh, the cashier was handing me my ID and my beer, uh, they said, happy birthday. And just because I was on autopilot, I said, you too, which makes no sense because obviously it wasn't their birthday. Um, so I was just anticipating that they would say something like, have a nice evening, something like that. And in which case, the proper response would be to say, you too, you as well. I, I wish you a happy evening as well. But since I was on kind of autopilot, I was expecting the cashier to say, have a nice evening or something, and they said happy birthday. So then when I said you too, that didn't make any sense. Now, since I wasn't necessarily firing on all cylinders here because I was tired or something, I, I in one sense, I was kind of acting like a wanton. I, I wasn't exactly concerned here um, with what I was doing, right? Now, so that being said, the main claim that Frankfurt is defending here is this, is that the ability to do otherwise is neither sufficient nor necessary for moral responsibility. So the ability to do otherwise is neither sufficient nor necessary for moral responsibility. So Frankfurt thinks that every version of the principle of alternative possibilities fails, whether it's a version of the principle of alternative possibilities that's uh, re uh, raised by a libertarian or a compatibilist doesn't matter. If you think that uh, the ability to do otherwise in some meaningful sense is either sufficient or necessary for moral responsibility, um, you're just wrong about this, okay? Now, so the easier part of the argument is that the ability to do otherwise is not sufficient for moral responsibility, okay? And here is why. Frankfurt says that the ability to do otherwise is not sufficient for moral responsibility, because even wontons have the ability to do otherwise, and no wonton is morally responsible. So the ability to do otherwise is not sufficient for moral responsibility, because even wontons possess the ability to do otherwise, and yet wontons are not morally responsible. So if the ability to do otherwise were sufficient for moral responsibility, well, given that wontons have the ability to do otherwise, they would be morally responsible. But since wontons are not morally responsible, that means that the ability to do otherwise is not sufficient for moral responsibility. Okay, so let's talk about one wonton in particular. In this case, my lovely tuxedo cat, Bigira. There's Bigira, Bigira Lorraine. I love her very much. Okay, now, um, as you can see here in this photo, Bigira is perched on my shoulder and I'm sharing a glass of Cabernet with my cat. So we have cats and Cabernet, all right? Um, when Bagheera was younger, she used to uh, jump on my shoulder pretty routinely and 
purr her little head off. Um, eventually, when she was bigger, she would sort of wrap her front end around one shoulder and then put her back legs around the other shoulder. But then as she got bigger, uh, that became more difficult for her to do. Eventually, it got to the point where when she would jump on my shoulders, she would almost knock me down. Okay, now, but one day... I started doing this. Um, so a lot of times she would try to jump on my shoulders as soon as I walked in the door. So um, one day I could hear her meowing as I was unlocking the door. And as soon as I entered my house, I, I took a step to the left. And immediately she was up on the bookshelf and she started kind of leaning forward and putting her paw out and meowing what so what was she doing she was trying to decide whether or not to jump right so since there was a longer distance between me and her Vigira didn't quite know in her own cat way of knowing things um she wasn't quite sure she wasn't too confident about whether or not she could make that jump so what was she doing she was deliberating whether or not to jump so even non-human animals, like my cat Bagheera, have that ability to engage in some sort of first-order deliberation. They, they have the, uh, in their own unique way, the decision-making capacity to make decisions about, okay, I want to jump, but I'm not sure I can make it, so uh, maybe it will be better for me to not jump. Now, clearly my cat Bagheera does not reason using that kind of terminology because she lacks the ability uh, to use language like that. But even my cat can make decisions. And, you know, that's what non-human animals can do. They, they can, you know, she can decide to eat or not eat. She can decide to jump or not jump. Okay, so my cat is a wonton and does possess the ability to do otherwise. You know, she can jump, she can not jump. But my cat is not morally responsible. She never has been. She's a wonton. She's a cat. Okay, now the the argument for why the ability to do otherwise is not necessary for more responsibility. This this argument is a little more in depth. Okay, so the point that Frankfurt is making here is this: the ability to do otherwise is not necessary for moral responsibility because we can lack the ability to do otherwise and still be acting of our own free will. So even if you're in a situation where you lack the ability to do otherwise, that is nevertheless consistent with still having free will and acting out of your free will. All right. Now, and in order to illustrate this, this is where we get the tale of the three drug addicts, which in case you're wondering, that was the Harry Potter book, which did not get published. Harry Potter and the tale of the three drug addicts. Okay. All right. Now, so this is a vitally important aspect of the, the story here. Okay. So this is true of all three of the drug addicts. So with all three of the drug addicts, it is true that given the nature of their addiction, none of the drug addicts are free to not take drugs. All right. So given the nature of their addiction, none of the, the three drug addicts are free to not take drugs. So if they are offered drugs, they will take the drugs. If there are drugs available, they will take the drugs. That is just the nature of how strong their addiction is. Okay, uh, so what that means is that all three of the drug addicts lack the ability to do otherwise. So if it is true that all three of the drug addicts are not free to take drugs, that means that they all lack the ability to do otherwise. Okay, so the first drug addict is the wonton drug addict. Okay, so they're a drug addict, but they're also a wonton. All right, now, so at the first order level, the wanton drug addict obviously has the first order desire to take drugs. Now, but since they're a wanton, they're not engaging in any kind of second order deliberation. So at the second order level, the wanton drug addict does not have any corresponding second order desires. So there's no congruence between their second order desires and first order desires. They're not engaged in any second order deliberation. They don't particularly have any care or concern for the nature of their will or the makeup of their will. Okay, now, but since the wanton drug addict lacks the ability to engage in second order deliberation, that means that the wanton drug addict does not have the type of will that they desire to have. Why? 
The wanton drug addict does not have the type of will that they desire to have precisely because they have no desires concerning the nature of the will whatsoever. Okay, But since the wanton drug addict does not have the type of will that they desire to have, they do not possess free will. Why? Because freedom of the will consists of having the kind of will that you desire to have. But since the wanton drug addict does not have the type of will that they desire to have, they do not have free will. And since they do not have free will, they are not morally responsible for their drug use. Okay, next we have the unwilling addict. So, once again, the unwilling addict is not free to not take drugs. Given the nature of their addiction, they lack the ability to do otherwise. So, again, at the first order level, uh, the willing, they're, I'm sorry, the unwilling drug addict has the desire to take drugs. Okay. Now, but at the second order level, the, the unwilling addict has the desire that the desire to take drugs be ineffective. They could either have that desire or they could have a desire that the desire to resist drugs be effective. Okay, so either way, whether they have the desire that the desire to take drugs be ineffective or they have the desire that the desire to resist drugs be effective, there is nevertheless incongruence between their first order desires and second order desires. So they desire to take drugs, but they desire that the desire to take drugs be ineffective. Okay, so the unwilling addict does not have the kind of will that they desire to have. Why? They want to take drugs, but they don't want to want to take drugs. They want their will to be different than the way their will is actually constituted. And since they don't have the kind of will that they desire to have, the unwilling drug addict lacks free will. And since the unwilling addict lacks free will, the unwilling addict is not morally responsible for their drug use. Okay, the last addict is the willing addict. So once again, the willing addict, just like the other two addicts, lacks the ability to do otherwise. So if they are offered drugs, they will take drugs. They are not free to not take drugs, okay? So the willing addict has a first order desire, a desire to take drugs, but at the second order level, the willing addict has the desire that the desire to take drugs be effective. So unlike the other two addicts, the willing addict does have the kind of will that they desire to have. So the willing addict desires to take drugs, but they also desire that the desire to take drugs be effective. So the willing addict has the kind of will that they desire to have. And since the willing addict has the kind of will that they desire to have, that means that the willing addict has free will. And since the willing addict has free will, that means that the willing addict is morally responsible for their drug use. Okay, so this is gonna sound a bit paradoxical, but this is nevertheless the case. So the willing addict is not free to not take drugs and yet is still taking drugs of their own free will. So the willing addict lacks the ability to do otherwise. The willing addict does not have the ability to not take drugs. That's the nature of their addiction. However, even though the willing addict lacks the ability to do otherwise, they are not free to not take drugs. They are nevertheless taking drugs of their own free will. Okay, now, so this is where Frankfurt thinks uh, a lot of philosophers who work in this area kind of misunderstand the nature of moral responsibility, okay? So the important question to moral responsibility is not, could I do otherwise? So versions of moral responsibility that rest on some version of the principle of alternative possibilities, whether it's, again, whether it's a compatibilist version of the principle or a libertarian version, depend upon the notion that capacity to do otherwise is somehow either necessary or sufficient for moral responsibility. But Frankfurt thinks that's the wrong kind of question to ask. No, the important question here is not, could I do otherwise? No, no, no. But would I do otherwise even if I could do otherwise? So it's not a matter of, could you do otherwise, but would you do otherwise even if you could do otherwise? Okay, so 
if you wouldn't do otherwise, even if you could do otherwise, then the fact you can't do otherwise is irrelevant. That's Frankfurt's point. So take the willing drug addict. Even if the willing drug addict possessed the ability to do otherwise, they would nevertheless still be taking drugs. Why? That's the nature of their will. They, they have a second order desire. They desire that the desire to take drugs be effective. So even if the nature of their addiction was different. So suppose they have rival first order desires. They have the desire to take drugs and the desire to resist drugs. So in that sense, they possess the ability to do otherwise. They have the ability to deliberate between their rival first order desires and then act in accordance with one over the other. But given the nature of their second order desires, even if they had a rival first order desire, the desire to resist drugs or something like that, the nature of their second order desire is that desire that the desire to take drugs be effective. So even if they could do otherwise, they wouldn't do otherwise. So the fact that they can't do otherwise is irrelevant. Now, but if the fact that an individual cannot do otherwise is irrelevant in determining whether or not uh, that person is morally responsible, then that means that the ability to do otherwise is not necessary for moral responsibility. So the ability to do otherwise is not sufficient for moral responsibility, and the ability to do otherwise is not necessary for moral responsibility. Okay, all right, that will suffice for that subject matter. So once again, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to email me, and thank you for listening.